Okay, so for the character design floral humanoids challenge, um, let's talk a little bit about it. So you were required to, um, using one or more of the references available in the flower references folder, uh, you were supposed to design a floral humanoid. And what really you're doing, it's a character design challenge, and you're the most, one of the most important um, uh, conditions or requirements of this challenge was to weave the anatomy. All right, so there's that point. And I'm going to be taking a look at whether or not you guys successfully did that. So as your art director in the studio, when we were hired to create a people for this story, whatever it is, um, let me pop out the chat. One of the major requirements for the for the narrative was to weave the anatomy successfully, to combine the anatomy w with the human anatomy, the anatomy of the flower with the, um, with the human anatomy. Another massive thing is to preserve the flower. Um, or the floral um, uh, characteristics. Alright, so that's something else I'm going to be looking at. And then a, a bunch of other stuff that has to do with character design, which is silhouette, uh, gesture, uh, the read, detail cluster, um, guiding the eyes, uh, function. There's a lot of stuff that goes into successful character designs. And um, all of that stuff is, I'm going to be covering that as well. We've covered, if you've missed a lot of what it means to design a character um, and uh, what, what you're responsible for as the designer, we have had other character design challenges in the past. Um, so if you just want to find them, you just have to go to my videos and then do a little search and write the word challenge and a lot of them will come up. Uh, we've designed villains, we've designed creatures, we've designed all kinds of stuff we've covered in the past. Um, we had... Uh, the Adventure Fellowship Character Design Challenge. We've had a lot of environment stuff. So if you haven't cut, caught any of these design challenges um, or watched the videos or the critique hours for them and the showcases for them, do catch them if you can. They're filled with um, with a, a lot of points that I make about designing a character and what's, what it entails. Uh, but this one specifically was about... Um, uh, so let's, let's read it. Use the references... As a, use the reference as a means to identify the species of flower for your humanoid as well as color combination which is very very important so let's say you were pitched the idea um, by you know your studio was pitched this idea and then and, and the writer was like I just see colors lots and lots of colors so this is really really important for you guys to remember that color is a big aspect of designing flowers and then the color combinations and um, preserving that from your reference uh, you may combine more than one flower of your design, however, there must be a distinct identifier, identifiable floral anatomy on your character. If that's missing, um, then it won't feel like it's a floral humanoid, it'll just feel like some sort of alien. Um, so really think about the mechanics of blooming, walking, petals, leaves, and gesture. These were part of the description I handed out um, a month ago. Uh, if they start looking like fish people, <laughs> you went in the wrong direction, so I'm going to basically look for this if they start looking like fish people I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question does this look like fish people we're gonna ask everyone does it look like a fish person because that's not what it was about it was about very very specifically it reading as a flower instantly um, using rough sketches experiment with different ways the flowers anatomy weaves into the characters human anatomy do not use images found in the inspirational references that was just stuff to inspire you um, the resource pack for this was available on my website on the community tab so if you miss this if, for a future reference the resource pack is available. I always hand it out on the wall. I, I pin it at the top of the community for a very long time. Um, please keep details in mind such as functionality, anatomy, and gesture. These will all help you portray a more believable character design. You are expected to submit at least three concept sketches, which a lot of you ignored. A lot of you did it anyway. And uh, that has led to the most successful concept designs I've seen today. And we'll talk about the most successful ones in my opinion. I'm sure you guys share the same. Um, there's a reason why we will all uh, find the same reference, or that means find the same design uh, beautiful. We will all have, like, unanimously believe that there's, this is the best one, whichever one it's going to be, because of the read, and we're going to talk about why it's so successful. Uh, please explore gesture above all in your sketches. We're talking about uh, characters. We're talking about uh, people who have multiple joints and multiple uh, areas of motion and mechanics. And, and, and joints that, that allow a lot of exploration. And not just that, we're combining it with the flexibility of a flower's anatomy. So if I find stiff images, if, if there's going to be stiffness, 
um, that's going to be a big issue. Uh, there should have been zero stiffness. It should have been like a, basically an airbender. If you want to c compare it to concept art we've seen in other, um, explored in other uh, media, it's, it's basically an airbender. If it doesn't look like an airbender, something went wrong. Um, however, some of you have explored it as a more um, like a villainous kind of flower. So a lot of you have designed like an older, older aged flower or something a little bit more grounded, rooted. That's fine. If you guys want to go for some more closed gestures, I'll be able to excuse that. But for those of you who did go for a blooming character design, something that looks happy, something that looks magical, something that looks um, colorful and jumpy like a circus uh, performer... Um, then, uh, then yeah, you should have been really, really gone into um, uh, gestures. And that's something that I wanted to add in the references. I wanted to say, think circus, but that would have been giving, given away. You guys might have found references that were a little bit too dancey and uh, gymnastic, and um, I, I would want you to always go back to more believable, organic, fluid, standing gestures. All right. So if they don't look like fluid standing gestures that look flexible, then I'm going to I'm going to take points off. There is no point system. Nobody loses anything. There's no reward system. Uh, there is, however, re rewards handed out just for my my merchandise. I just handed out to those who make the best notes. So if you guys have notes, make them and um, and hand them in, I mean, and show them in the class notes subcategory on the community wall so that we can take a look at that. And uh, I can gift you guys some brushes. I gift out like probably five to six a month nowadays. Um, so if you if you do post some really really good notes, I, I they won't they won't be ignored. <clears throat> um, the final must submission must be fully rendered. Uh, as always, the common thread between these challenges is to put you in a workplace environment where your art and design skills are tested and limited by design requirements. So again, if you guys are doing your own thing and you ignored what I wrote in the brief, you're not you're not turning into a successful character design artist. This is supposed to build your portfolio. It's supposed to prepare you for those who really want to take this into a job um, format. It's supposed to, um, you know encourage you to work with with restraints with limits and not always be explore your inner snowflake but really really work under pressure and learn how to work under pressure sometimes they don't allow us to be snowflakes sometimes we want to throw in these crazy te textures in a certain kind of face but we're not allowed and we are expected to follow what the art director is, uh, is informing what they're directing what they're what the narrative is is restricting um, whatever it may be hired, whatever you may be hired for in the future. There are always requirements and always restrictions, and these are supposed to help you to work within restrictions. <clears throat> and, the, and then the brief is the, uh, the restriction. Uh, please include one quote that represents your chosen flower. It can be their catchphrase or prayer or something like that. And um, you were supposed to include a character name, a humanoid catchphrase, max 100 characters, and the design must be in color with a gray background. You can't, this wasn't an environment challenge. You can, uh, you were allowed to put tiny little um, signatures of like uh, pieces of earth or, or a flat ground underneath or something like that, but um, uh, nothing extensive, no extensive environment design. This was not an environment design challenge. <clears throat> so let's take a look at them. I'm so friggin' excited. I can't wait to see some of these. Um, I want to look at them in order, but I, I really don't know the order with which to, to, to take a look. We'll just dive in. Let's just choose one by one. Um, I might not do all of them. I have to get out of here at 6 p.m. sharp. Um, I'll try to push it to 6.15, uh, but, uh, but yeah, let's get started. So this is Jeremy's um, Pip Boy of the Wood, and his quote is mine. That's adorable. Um, a couple of things that were problematic that I saw that I noticed instantly. So I like how if it works as a shell, I'm not sure if he wears it, I'm not sure if he grew into it, but as a floral design, um, it's, it doesn't read as a mushroom. There are some areas where you could have weaved in the anatomy of the of the mushroom. Um, areas where like the stem of the mushroom or the, or the, or the bark, of, what was it called, like the, like the main body of the mushroom and then you got little to the hat on top. Uh, you could have attached that somewhere in his body. You could have made that um, work on his body somehow. It reads more as a shell. So it's like he found a mushroom and then hollowed it out and then um, just lived in it. So if this was pitched for me after we've been hired to do a character design concept and um, and we had like this kind of, uh, kind of like a negative read, we definitely would have gone back and reviewed some of the design choices just because of the brief and the specificities of the brief. But beside all that, there are some other tiny little form problems. 
So what you want to do, because this, in a silhouette situation, when I say silhouette, whenever I say silhouette, just think if this character was completely silhouetted like black against a white background, so a complete shadow, and uh, would we be able to read a character design? Would we be able to see floral humanoid? Would we be, so, we, we, would we, we wouldn't see all of it, but we would see some of it left over um, in the, in the, in the uh, silhouette. So right here, this, this mushroom piece is taking up a lot of this. And I can see this weaving into a narrative very beautifully. Maybe the way he's introduced in the comic book or something is you just see a little mushroom, uh, like top peeking out, slowly getting bigger behind a, like a, like some grass or something, and eventually he's re he's revealed as the gentle creature he is, or something like that. Reminds me of the good dinosaur, the little kid from the good dinosaur. Um, but yeah, this massive piece right here is taking up a lot of space, and it can't take up that much space and be a flat form. It has to be a full form. So the way we do that is by building radially. That's how we accomplish that. So what I'm doing now is I'm just erasing away so that it can feel like a three-dimensional object. Like that. Never mind. I had to erase away from the layer before then. Okay. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to build this radially. Trying to make it read as a large form structure. It was reading a bit flat. And the only way for you to really form something, to really put something together and make it feel like the original native geometry it comes from, is to zoom out. That's the best thing. But that that's my first first thing that just threw out that, that came out to me is the um the uh, the lack of core shadow, the lack of real structure for this large sphere wherein you carry a lot of the character design. So what I'm trying to do now is um, get some bounce light. After you establish bounce light, after you establish core shadow, you bring in the bounce light, and the bounce light is coming off from the ground underneath. So these are the first most important steps to take, especially for anything that's taking up this much space for the character design. Other issues, exactly the same issue. So right now, the biggest diagnostic that I can I can see the diagnosis is. You need to do some more form studies because these should not have been easily ignorable. They should, they should have been very, very difficult to ignore. And because the light source is coming from above, the light climbed upward. We would have been, we would have seen larger core shadows. So just around the face, what I'm doing is I'm trying to make this read as a, as a form. So I'm throwing in one large core shadow and then interrupting it and editing it where we have stronger kind of like uh, altitudes interrupting that core shadow. The eyeball itself is also another form structure and it didn't have enough light and shadow on it. So another instance where we could have seen uh, a little bit more of an identify like a sharp consideration of the form. Just like this. It's got very, very large eyes. So there's no amount of anatomy, however large, that's exempt from core shadows. Core shadows are really, really important. Sorry I'm not looking at the chat. I'll look once I'm ready. Um, right now we have to get through these. And then you can, you can ask your questions. And when you do ask your questions, please make sure to write my name or else I won't see it. And now for the highlights, I'm just going to throw, because typically his eyes should be more hydrated, so we get more light across this. So you treat it as a, as a 3D model. If this was a 3D model, would we use the same texture for the eyeballs as we would for the skin? No, we would make the eyeball, eyeballs have a larger specularity, like a larger potential to shine and sparkle. And these are just some of the mi minor little issues that I have found. Um, while looking at this, just just basic stuff. There's a lot of light coming in from the top, so you could have really made him get some of that subsurface scattering on his ears. Really nice opportunity to throw that in there, and that would have been the same pink on them, just more of a pink version. Same thing with the hair. The hair really, really feels very flat. You could have brought in a lot of 
subsurface scattering. A subsurface scattering is going to be something I talk about a lot today. And the rule with subsurface scattering is illuminate and saturate. That means that you're raising the brightness along the, 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 the transparency of the texture and you're bringing in saturation. And this is just one of those instances right here where you could have brought in some light to sit at the very top of his head and reveal the presence of the light constantly pointing back to the light source. And the same thing here, we're, build, we're building radially just along the head space right here. Just the most sticky-outy part. <laughs> By the way, anyone who writes sticky-outy in their notes has a higher chance of <laughs> winning the brushes. Oopsie. Okay, color. I really wanted to do a full class today, but um, I'm going to have to leave. Um, really like sharp at 6.15. I hope, hopefully I can get through enough by 6.15. I wanted to have a two hour class really badly. Oops. Oh well. Okay. Try to get through these as fast as possible. So form studies. So yes, this was a character design and I should be talking about design, but I can't talk about design and not talk about form. So do you guys see how no matter what masterpiece you bring in, with what kind of premise, with what kind of narrative uh, restrictions, form is form. Form is form is form. If you don't know how to put form together, you're sacrificing the success of the concept and the ex successful execution of the concept. So you see, there's no way, no style, no amount of self-importance, no amount of snowflakey uh, self-appreciation will ever exempt you from doing your form size. All right? I'm not saying the artist here is a snowflake. <laughs> I'm not saying that, Jeremy. Um, but I'm saying that it, this is how important form studies are. All right, so I'm just getting a dark version. And I'm just darkening this, um, oops, darkening this hair further it gets from the light source. And then saturate and illuminate, as the rule says. So to saturate on, on uh, Photoshop, you just get the sponge tool and um, saturate along. So you're really giving off the presence of the light source. And not just that, what's the color of the light source? We talk about this a lot. It's a very yellow color. So let me build up radially the highest point of this mushroom. Maybe it's not this shiny, but let me just treat it as that so we can get the, the class. And then I'm just going to throw another core shadow just on the sides. I reserve my brightest brights and my darkest darks for only the areas that really need them, the most displaced from the light source. So this is the remnant of that core shadow right here. Um, as for color choice, uh, color combination, I feel like you didn't choose the best colors. Um, but it really just depends on how we use it. If this was used for a Disney movie, these colors would be fine. Um, what I would have started off with was a very, very warm palette and then be very, very careful not to not to uh, exit that warm palette and you know, just stay inside sunlit colors, so oranges, yellows. Uh, there was a great opportunity for a yellow in here. Um, but that's pretty much it. That was that's that's all that I could recommend for this one for now. All right. So before, after, we're just giving it more three-dimensional shape, whereas before it felt a little bit like cell shaded. Uh, and that's how you should be going around this. The exact same applies for the arms. The arms are still very very cell shaded. Okay. So I did kind of make it red because red is a is a darker value. This was a pink mushroom top. Can fix that easily by raising the value so that red doesn't exist in the higher values just like this. And it's back to pink. Okay? So form studies, don't forget them. They, they benefit you in every possible way. <clears throat> Alright, so that's a PNG so it's gonna take a second. Um, Alright, so let's look at this one. This one is beautiful. Please make sure that I can download your stuff. If you don't have downloads available, users can download my images and whatnot on, on your Google Plus uh, settings. I won't be able to download your stuff. So this, I had to screenshot it. So the resolution for this is really low. This is beautiful. 
Um, but it, it does have, it does contain some stuff I wasn't looking for, which is weaving the petals in as a dress. Um, it, but it's just, you just kind of do it asymmetrically, which is really nice. I just didn't want to see a scarf, headdress, or skirt. Um, I didn't want to see the petals used as clothing. I wanted to see something else, something new. Um, but that's fine. It's still beautifully painted. The gesture is gorgeous. Um, the way you painted the hands is wonderful. The little sinews underneath the thighs, beautiful job. Um, uh, the little uh, whisk, I don't know what these are called, these little tails. I don't know what they're called in the anatomy of a flower, but they're, they, they're just these little, I don't know. And um, they're just the, ge the gesture itself. The silhouette is wonderful. Uh, the anatomy is weaved, but not 100%, but you can get away with it, especially if it was just an NPC and not the main character. Um, the, the, the flower characteristics are very, very familiar. I can tell this is a flower human. Um, the silhouette gesture, the reed, the detail cluster, the cluster is what the final issue would be, which is it's one thing I would do is I would just darken her feet gradually towards a gradient and I would give her feet a darkness to them because right now what I want to do to see how long her feet are I want to direct the attention all the way back up but her feet are very very long and everything is happening up here and nothing is happening down there that's why we don't allow that brightness to go all the way down all right so I'm just shading this so it doesn't look flat but it's still gonna get darker the further down you get and just some t minor little changes here but it's still a darker foot the lower you get so now the eyes are directed straight back up and the detail cluster is framed off so in your character design if you feel like um, you need some framing darkening the hands and feet or doing something to the hands and feet kind of leads the eyes from 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 trailing right off the canvas hands and feet are long they work as a route as an exit route to, to, to exit the concept. What we want to do is trap people inside the concept to constantly look at it as the stage and that's something that we do a lot. Uh, the hands you can get away with just as long as the feet which are very very long don't distract um, and guide the eyes off the uh, like, a, like a swift highway right off the concept. So that's something I recommend. This is definitely a portfolio ready. It's beautiful. Um, one thing that we didn't have is the presence of the light source, which at this at this point is an optional. When it comes to flowers, we really want to see that. We want to see like that the, the environment they come in. We can't paint the environment. We can paint the environment on top of the character, and that purple on yellow is going to look wonderful. Of course, we can't have a warm yellow. It has to be a bit of a cool yellow. So that's why we the cooling a yellow basically makes it more white. That's how you cool a yellow down. You can't take it into green because then it'd just be green. And you can't darken it because then it would just be brown. It would turn into a brown. So this is on a soft light layer. And what I'm doing is I'm just slowly introducing that white. I shouldn't start with the knees. Just along the chest. Along the arms. And what I'm doing, what I'm guiding this brush along, the geometry is guiding my brush. The cylindrical geometry, the native geometry of the arm is what's guiding my arm, my, my brush right now. And then for the face, they're very, very standard faces. And this is why we do a 14 day challenge. So when you do a front face again, it's not your third time ever drawing a face. Your list is like your 50th time drawing a face and it looks wonderful and it reads from a distance and you have all the core shadows right where they belong. This is why we do 14 day challenges. When we do character designs, it counts character requires a face more than it requires anything else. If it doesn't have a face for those smart asses who said, what if it doesn't have a face? What if it has a mask on? Um, at that point, you can go ahead and invest a lot of the character design on the body. Okay? So the, the geometry right now is guiding my hand, and I'm still using the same paint, which is a very yellow-white and I'm trying to preserve all these core shadows. So you're bringing out the, the leg, you're bringing out the arms, you're bringing them out towards, uh, shading along a z-axis, shading radially. And then another chance that you had for sub -sub some subsurface, another chance for us for some subsurface scattering. So we've got subsurface scattering is when a shadow is diffused outside of its core shadow completely. When the, when the, an object is diffused outside of its core shadow, where wherein we would have had 
a core shadow, we have a little bit of a bloom or something glowing. And that's the light coming through the object, getting trapped inside its translucency. And this is something very, very uh, characteristic of flowers and petals. They're like a silk. They're a very see-through silk. So I'm just going to saturate. And this is just the presence of the light through. Of course, you really have to be right in the sun to have this happen on your character. The sun has to be behind and there would be some kind of silhouette. Um, in this specific way I painted it, it's kind of a cheat. doesn't really follow exactly the presence of the light source. But if the light source was coming up, coming from a position higher, um, then higher and in front of, then behind and uh, lower than, so these pieces right here, this little piece, these fan pieces that, that fan out horizontally would get some subsurface scattering. But mostly it's find the core shadow and that's where the subsurface scattering is, just like that. Do you see that? And some more along here. It's always in the shadows. If you don't know where, where, where subsurface scattering happens, it's in the shadows. Where we would have a shadow, we just have this stuff glowing. Okay, we just find select areas where the light really just shines through and you're diffusing the shadows this way or else you know what it's going to read as? It's going to read as some sort of runway fabric. Flower petals are see-through and you have to ask yourself the lesson here isn't permanently remember that flowers are see-through. That's a bit specific for a fundamental. The fundamental that's connected to that is identify the texture, the behavior of that texture, the density of that texture. So I need to erase some of these. Some sub sub subsurface like uh, remnants do have like a, a specific like they have like a specific root. They don't escape that root. So right here, right in the lower half, the downward looking half of this petal is what looks at the light, and it has a very specific edge to it, like a root. <clears throat> so we just have to follow the contour lines, and that's the fundamental link to that rule. Okay, and then the full before and after. Okay, so the presence of the light source is really what we've added. We've boosted the form another step forward, which you were cut, which was holding back just a little bit. Her thigh seems a little bit see-through, so what you can do is bring in some subsurface scattering, but you don't bring it everywhere, just on either side. So it looks like the light has been trapped inside her thigh. So not fully humanoid and just a little bit transparent everywhere else. And what we're doing is between the highlight and the shadow, we're throwing a little saturation. A belt of saturation, just like this. And that's how you take it from, from one level to the next. We're not completely changing the color of her arm. We're only showing the subsurface scattering. This scattering just enters just around the cheeks. You might want to saturate just a little bit on the cheeks and the lips. They seem just a little bit hidden. Um, the expression is wonderful. Very, very expressive. Okay, so before, after. We're boosting, we're bringing contrast where it belongs. We're moving along the form on the z-axis. Everything is guided by the contours. Everything is grounded by form. All our choices. Okay, next up would be, um, there was this really great one right here, beautiful job. Uh, she looks more like a, a warrior than a, um, like a, than like some sort of priest or magician, which is fine, it wasn't required. Uh, you do have some anatomical asymmetries happening here, so for the hips, this is wonderful by the way, for the hips we have, okay, so. We've got this form. We need that on the other side, hidden by the torso, the torso shape. We also need some more of the thigh visible. This is a very, very wide thigh. It's not all hidden by the torso. If it was completely hidden by the torso, we'd have one leg in front, and the other thigh's side, which is your showing, wouldn't be visible. Uh, so stack, when you're doing gestures, and you, after you're done your gesture lines, and you want to stack your forms and preserve the symmetry, you do so on your shape stage. So there's three stages for a gesture drawing, the gesture line, 
uh, it's a spine, everything that has to do with the motion and the animation of the, of the gesture and the, mo the movement of it. On top of those lines, you have shapes. So you've got squares, cubes, cylinders, whatever you need to sum up and, and, and lock in the anatomy. And the final line is the uh, line art. So you lower the opacity of the first two stages and throw the line art on top, and, you have, and then you have a completed gesture sketch. These issues could have been avoided if you took those steps. I'm not sure if you did. Maybe you ignored some of these steps. Maybe they just weren't, you just didn't detect them on your radar. Uh, but this is some major asymmetry right here. Um, other than that, this is just wonderful. This is beautiful work. It's just a little bit of asymmetry always catches off. Um, that throws me off. Uh, the anatomy is beautiful. It definitely reads as uh, if you've weaved the anatomy successfully. However, um, it's starting to read as a costume more than you actually combining the two anatomies together. Um, so it reads as a runway costume. And that, that is a sign of weak design when we, when we just always use the cosplay version of the character design instead of really redesigning and creating a creature. This was, in a sense, a creature design. I just didn't want to call it a, a creature design, but this is, in a sense, a creature design. And uh, that's, that, that's why we have to think about the most important unit of this design challenge was unifying the, the anatomies together. And at this point, you're dressing them up in petal costumes uh, instead of making the character a whole new creature, which is what you're supposed to do for these kinds of uh, designs. Um, so the boots feel a little bit like clothing. Everything else feels stuck on or plastered on or sewn in. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff, though. Only the pure of heart receive the forest blessing. It was like a warrior or some sort of guardian, really reading that off. I love the cast shadows. I'm just a sucker for cast shadows. Beautiful colors. Um, you've actually managed to make all the colors really analogous and, ha and harmonious. But it's just this tiny little issue that's thrown off the symmetry. <clears throat> One other thing that I could recommend for the form uh, part is the same thing that I just did with the previous character. You want to build the form radially. A lot of you are building them along gradients. Gradient is not form. A gradient does not create form. A gradient is only Z and, and Y. They're not, there's no x-axis when we paint gradients. It's just from one side to the next. Um, and when we build radially, that's when we start getting these believable kind of masses and an object of low density draping over an object of high density inherits that object's uh, core shadows and highlights and so what I'm doing again is I'm finding the cylinder of the arms and this is all stuff you could you can explore in a lab environment in the setting of a lab environment uh, grayscale background and just sketch some bodies and you'll be able to make all these mistakes before you're required to design anything along a, a character design. So it's best to just make the mistakes beforehand in the safety of a lab environment instead of making them so late when it really counts. I could, I could like really, really see some saturation or maybe some gradient saturation. So just along the very root of every one of these petals, just to make it look like it really is growing out of her. Because at this point it just feels like a bodysuit. I would saturate some of these shadows for the sake of the subsurface scattering, maybe saturate the tips. Just something to bring in a little bit more intrigue because right now it's pretty grayscale and it feels like a dying forest than a, than, a, than a living one. So just along some areas. And you can saturate in gradients. Flowers do have that. The pigment runs out. So you end up getting gradients. And I'm just saturate, saturating with the sponge tool just along the tips or the edges of every one of these petals to show that the pigment is running out to, sh to try to show some anatomy in all of this. Okay, so I'm just going to go to Dodge Tool on Midtones one more time, zoom all the way out and reassess some of these forms, connect some of these core shadows together, some of these highlights. The stomach feels just a little bit forced. And the reason why that feels forced is because, by the way, if I don't get to these, I have decided that I'll extend this on to Thursday. So if I didn't get to your stuff today, it's, it's okay. Don't fret. I will get to your stuff eventually. And you guys have till Thursday to post them, but I, I'm leaving this exactly as it is. I'm not going to bring in any more. You have till Thursday 
to post them, but they're most likely not going to be seen on next Thursday's class. If I don't get to everyone's today, anyone who I didn't get to today, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you guys off on Thursday. So I'm still putting those who did hand in by today priority. I'm still giving them priority. So you see what I'm doing here? I'm trying to show that the separation between the rib cage, the diaphragm area, and the stomach. And the reason why it felt like a bodysuit is because a lot of the stomach wasn't visible. So what I'm trying to do now is show off some of the stomach's anatomy. Just so show off something that is still human and naked and it feels like this, this really does belong. So I'm just adding in a belly. Just from my visual library. I don't really have a reference right now. Just to show off some, some leftover form underneath all of this costuming and what you did was you drew every ab in. you didn't sculpt the abs in that's problematic <clears throat> so when I do that we can see that there is a an inconsistency in the rotation of the body so there's some 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 rules you still have left to learn about rotating this whole section that I drew with red marker is still missing don't forget that but this is just extending the, that, that cast shadow all the way around. You have a lot of cast shadows. There's no reason why the ribs can't cast a shadow on the rest of the stomach. And you have a lot of chances here for really illuminating. And there's these sharp cast shadows are an indication of what? What do these ca cast shadows mean? Can anyone answer this question? I'll wait for it. A sharp cast shadow, what does it reveal about the light source? Really try to find these cast shadows everywhere else. And then once you establish your core shadows, which is a, can be a cast shadow, can be a gradient, can be a red, not gradient, but radial gradient, um, you can then start at throwing in your diffuse. And that makes the object even more three-dimensional. <clears throat> exactly, Adam, thank you. Sharp shadows equal a strong light source. So if the light source is this strong and we're seeing this much of the character, that means there has to be a very strong light source illuminating all the areas that do look up at the light. And it means that these cast shadows behave consistently. Everything casts a shadow at this point. And a strong light source means stronger diffuse. It means there's going to be stronger bounce light everywhere else around the body. All these core shadows, they don't get to just exist there very long. They're not safe when the light source is this strong. They do get sharp, of course. These are sharp rays, really close up, really strong. By strong light source, I mean it can be strong either because it's a bright light source or it's really, really close to the character or something. That's why I put that shine in there in the very first. That's why I'm saturating along these, uh, along these shadows with some subsurface scattering. This is a very strong light source you've indicated. And, and flowers like the sunlight, so they're, 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 um, they're kind of like a... What, what, what's they bloom in the sun sometimes or not really they bloom at night too they just crave the sunlight they're a plant and that whole photosynthesis thingy majiggy we have to hint to that so throwing in some more bounce light revealing some more core shapes core shadows some more geometry native geometry really important stuff to make this object feel sculpted and real we're 3d we're, we're 3d artists who don't have a 3d modeling program Right, just because we're two-dimensional, we only have two-dimensional um, uh, two dimensions to paint, does not mean that we should ignore all of these uh, units that 3D modelers explore. Which is finding that that secondary light source, revealing more of the form that they sculpted. Being a 2D artist is, is harder than anything. It's harder than 3D modeling. There's a lot of knowledge you have to learn yourself. You have to host yourself in your brain through your memory alone. And not just that, execute it on a canvas consistently along anatomy and other units of form, other, other uh, fundamentals. It's not just about memorizing anatomy. We have to paint, there's technique, there's brushwork, there's blending. There's a lot of stuff that, that a 2D artist is responsible for. So one more thing, just bringing that belly button to a close radially introducing the darkest point of that belly button. 2D art is probably the hardest thing about this whole visual art dilemma that we're in. 
I'm going to slowly radially um, connect the, uh, the, the crotch area to the rest of the thigh and then bring in some more form to the thigh. I probably should do that on a new layer. It's the hardest because there's just there's so much involved in it and it's the steepest climb improvement wise. So when it comes to let's say dermatology, um, there's a textbook, you read it, you memorize everything and you look like like you look for the hints for when this illness is happening. You look for these illnesses, you follow textbook, you're very, very close to your manual. But when it comes to art, it seems like there's never been a manual, there never will be a manual. There's just too much knowledge to put in one tiny little manual. So if you start to develop an instinct towards where the paint goes instead of um, anyone directing you or telling you, hey, in this kind of situation, use this kind of paint. There's nothing like that out there that guides us. So it's all instinctive. And it's all to do with your visual library. Your only manual, if there was one, was, would be your brain. I mean, I wish there was a manual. I wish we could just download it. I wish we could download fundamentals into our brains, but till that happens, till that's possible, we just have to do studies. We go into the lab environment and we just and we just memorize. Maybe one day, maybe one day there will be. But if there is, if you can download it, that'd be the stupidest cheat ever. This thigh in the distance is a little bit dark, much darker than this thigh for some reason, which is attracting all the light to it. So what I would do is defuse this thigh completely. And because this, uh, this, this leg is so important, I would give this leg more contrast. This leg should be the one that's dark, just like we did with that uh, purple, purple flower girl. We just give this one the contrast it needs and the saturation it needs. This one seems blue and this one just seems gray. So color, grab that and just throw that color on top. Okay, maybe I grayed out that thigh too hastily. I'll just go back to before I did that. And, yep, and just erase. It just grays out the further you get. Oops, didn't want to do that. Okay. You see that? This thigh was the one that felt like it was in the distance because it was gray and had no contrast. And this one was in the distance, but it did have the color and the contrast. So we just inverted that. Okay, um, so let's look at the before and after. All right, please don't forget those red marks that I made. Those are just some anatomy issues you really need to look into. I don't have time to detail the belly button completely. All right, so we're building, we're creating a form structure before, I mean before, after. Presence of the light source is now synced with this sharpness of the, of the cast shadows. I wish I had more time for the belly, but just throwing in some rough stuff here. It's still too much. There's the indentation of the belly right at the start and right along here. And you don't sketch in every ab, you try to sculpt them in. So after you get the basic core shadow of the belly, then you can throw in the dot of every little ab and you build that radially and then you will get abs very, very quickly if you just saw that read. Um, so the core shadow comes first and then the little dots per ab. But I really don't recommend abs at this point. It's reading more as a, as as a like a costume. Um, so try to keep some of the femininity of the flower in there intact. Try to find ways to weave some of this. Uh, again, you see that scarf thing? I told you a lot of you don't do the scarf. Um, don't do the petal, the scarf petal. Uh, if you if you can if you can avoid it, if you can uh, manage to to just like ignore that instinct. <laughs> Okay, so before the belly, very, very flat. And now we actually have some cast shadows, but still I would need more time. I'm a perfectionist with my paintovers. Um, okay. Beautiful work. 
Uh, so the silhouette was wonderful, the gesture was wonderful, the read definitely in the silhouette, but there was the problem with weaving the anatomy, which is the biggest challenge, and that's why it's, it's a challenge. We're doing something that we've never done before. Um, this one is wonderful. Everyone loved this one. And uh, the gesture, uh, the fact that you weave the anatomy in, it's still kind of reading as a costume, but just something about the way you had the petals sprouting out of the thighs. It is, again, still reading as a boot. Um, the hair at the top, this gradient between the ha the face color and the hair is kind of reading as a as as it's as it's weaved into the anatomy. Um, but something that if I'm trying to remember where I saw it, um, but yeah, uh, if we take a look at the way the anatomy was weaved into the uh, the sea creatures, dead man's from dead man's chest, just sailors, um, the uh, the sea people. The Davy Jones. <clears throat> so let's see where they are. There's this scene when this really, really old fish is 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 kind of stuck into this to the ship, and when he sticks his head out to talk to the protagonist, he kind of leaves his brain behind, and his brain is still pulsing. I thought that was so ingenious. Um, but this is kind of what I mean by weaving the anatomy. It doesn't look like. A character design um, just through a costume it actually looks like this is part of their face so this guy right over here his head is flatter and smaller than a usual human's head this guy is a humanoid this guy is a humanoid and this guy is a humanoid um, that's really what I wanted you guys to think about and I talked about this when I first announced the the, 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 the challenge so remember that I did talk about it I did refer to this as the most in my opinion, the most successful character design I've ever seen that unifies anatomy between animal and human. Um, it's just nothing has, has, has compared to this. It's amazing. It's top notch. And that's why, you know, that's what Hollywood gets. They get the top notch stuff. But that's really my, my the biggest example I have to show you what I mean by weaving all that anatomy together. Okay. So a lot of you are still pu pulling from that costume. Uh, just kind of runway costume, creative runway, but gesture, color combination, um, form. I see some beautiful coarse shadows, some cast shadows, nothing too extensive, sharp cast shadow wise. It seems like it's an off, kind of like a cloudy day. It's not perfect, perfect sunlight or perfect cast shadows. So you have gotten away with that. I see some radial shading here, some radial shading here. Um, just a beautiful character design that I definitely would see in a movie like Epic or something, if you guys have seen that. They do try to combine a flower anatomy with a humanoid, um, but some of it does still look like it's costume and cosplay instead of real weaving of anatomy. But beautiful job. As for my recommendations, um, just general anatomy consistency. The width of your ankle is usually somewhat similar to or near near to the width of your of your wrist. So here it seems like a stylistic deliberate, like a deliberate, deliberate, deliberate style. Um, and um, what you could have done if you really just wanted to give it more of a B thing, I know you're giving it the B foot, is try to get rid of the foot completely. And that would read more as a B. So we would get rid of that completely, just like this. Okay, then it would really, we wouldn't need to, to, the, the, to worry about the width. We wouldn't, we would just say, oh, well, this is an alien, an alien, um, like a being. It's not, we're not expecting a full human anatomy from it. But the density or the size of his uh, shoulders and then the muscle of his chest area and the th thickness of his thighs, it's all leading or, or suggesting that the better option would just be giving him the full width of the, of the, of the foot, the full width of the, uh, of the ankle bone. So just doing a little thing like this. That's the only thing that's kind of bugging me about this, but everything else is so well done. It's a fluid standing gesture. Remember, this was about getting standing, standing gestures. So a little thing like that would have gone a long way. I know you're probably going for that stylistic ballet kind of uh, uh, slimness to the foot and trying to relate it back to a bee, but this was not a uh, creature design, and, and we're not combining a bee anatomy with, uh, with, a, with a human's anatomy or an animal's anatomy uh, with a human's anatomy. We're combining a flower's anatomy. 
So spend more time finding ways to scientifically think about it. And if you guys really think about it, all of the challenges thus far have had a lot of scientific component to them. Actually sitting there and thinking, you know, how if I was a, a, a molecular biologist, or what are they called? Like a, I'm not sure what they're called, but the people who try to make things and gen genetics and cloning and all of that. If you were one of those scientists and you were trying to create a chimera, um, how would you, what would you choose? What, what? parts, which chromosomes would you choose to preserve, which, what, what would you combine with what, um, what would happen to the spine, what would happen to the stems, um, would they have two hands, would they even have fingers, would they need fingers, uh, these are real science, scientific questions, these are the real questions here, um, these are the real godly questions that you have to ask yourself if you are combining and working as a concept artist and combining two major worlds of anatomy, what are you preserving, what are you leaving behind? Um, a lot of this is starting to look like costume design and basically it would have been a if it would have been successful if it was a floral costume design challenge but it wasn't that it's a floral humanoid and uh, we're thinking chimera kind of deal uh, combining two anatomies together and seeing how they how they work and how they um, you know how, how, how much synergy you can get away with so let's say for the head for me if I was like if I was designing one I didn't have time I really wanted to participate in this but one of the biggest choices I would have made is I would have chosen the, the I'm not sure what it's called, I need to read into what, it's, it had a label of flower, but the little bud area, like the little, uh, the little um, like the heart of the flower, and then you got the, the, the petals, I would have done something where I would have placed the face right on here. And then there's something here would have been indicated that this is the inner brain, and every, every one of these petals is like another facet, is the spine. And then I would have somehow figured out a way to attach the spine and link some of the rest of the flower in there. And then maybe uh, use the, the flower's legs or something as a... Um, it's hard, you know, thinking, sitting here trying to think about the next revolutionary way to combine two anatomies. That's the real question. You have to sit there and ruminate for a while. But some of the petals, maybe the, the, the weeds. And then if it was a female, I would I get some of the females, uh, the human female anatomy signatures. Um, lengthening the neck provides a lot of female like, femininity and beauty to it. Um, maybe the face is over here, but the uh, but the eyes are somewhere else. Maybe this face is just there and flat and doesn't speak. Maybe the mouth is somewhere out of the way. So it's a humanoid. Um, shoulders would be maybe bare, just to recommend or and, and like a, not recommend. Uh, what's the word? like a hint at some femininity of the silhouette, like some, some silhouette that has some female in it and recognizable. And of course we would need the curve uh, of the female and then we go back down towards. And I have to fight the urge to make a petal as the skirt because that's just, <laughs> that's such a, a basic thing to do. It's such a um, generic thing to do. Fight, fight that urge and find another way to introduce um, something, something to, to tie off the anatomy in another way. Um, so I would give it two legs. It's a humanoid, so it needs two legs. But as for, you know, knees and joints, I'll probably give it more joints. I'd probably do a little thing like that. Give it some kind of extra little joint. And, um, I don't know, it's starting to look like it's dancing. But that's kind of what I meant when you guys are combining uh, the, the anatomies together. Finding different ways to introduce the human, the visible human, the recognizable human. Um, while still preserving the silhouette of the flower. And in that silhouette, we could see, oh yeah, two arms and two legs. But everything else out of that, you could have just completely thrown out the window. Um, you didn't have to make it make sense um, um, anatomically. It didn't have to look like a human, a real human realistic. Like you didn't have to have eight heads length and two heads on the side uh, width. You could have made it a very, very long body. But there just has to be a way for you to tie it back together. And that was the challenge. <clears throat> but beautiful, beautiful work all around. I really, really like this one. The colors, the, the bee, everything about it was so adorable. All right. So let's find another example of this. Um, this one I really liked, but again, it just looked like a fashion show. Another example of that, especially the heels. Um, one thing I did like is how her, her hood is attached to her skin. And um, I'm trying, like, if I saw a seam do this, I wouldn't have seen that. I would have just seen it as, oh, another character, another costume design, um, floral costume design. Um, and this is kind of weaved in, do you see that? It's kind of like a seamless, if it was a bodysuit, it's a very well-made bodysuit. 
it just looks like it's completely connected. I'm surprised none of you tried to combine two flowers in the same, so if they source from the same bud, but they're two completely different uh, creatures. So that one of them has a head that looks like this, kind of like a Sisters of Fate kind of deal, and they share the same leg, or they have like a, uh, they snake a little bit, so their weeds are kind of what carry them around. But you can really see a very, very defined floral, like a humanoid aspect to these and how they link together. So I'm surprised none of you tried the two, the dual characters in one, uh, sourcing out of one stem. I'm surprised none of you did underwater plants. Um, so I didn't say you can't do underwater plants, I just said don't make them look, make them look like fish people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, underwater plants were just fine, maybe like some sort of coral reef or some kind of flower that does bloom in water. There are some beautiful flowers that we put in tea. So it's like a tea, it's like tea leaves, but they're in the shape of a flower and they bloom under the flower, under the water. You could have tried something like that. <clears throat> you could have painted it above water or below water. What happens to that flower when it's underwater and maybe its strength is underwater, but above water, it's like a, a wilted little, very, very jagged geometric looking thing. And then um, underwater, it's very curvy and it finds its true, true strength or whatnot. Um, yeah, and when it came to male or female, you could have just gone for the typical upper body strength at the top for male, and then lower, smaller, lower body, um, and then a larger, lower body for female, and then a smaller, upper body, um, and then worked with that to, to, to give off the feeling of female and male. You didn't have to depend on the boobs. Remember, we talk a lot about not depending on the sexual organs to make the visibility of the gender. There are ways that you can distribute mass that make it look like a female and a male. Just this alone is starting to look like a male. This already reads just these sketches here. Um, so not depend too much on the sexy and the sex and the and the curvature and the boobs and the and the seductive position, like the seductive pose and the heels. Um, so remember, this was not a costume design challenge. It was a, a the actual, actual anatomy challenge. Um, what I would recommend for the, to change this is it's just there's too much brightness. And if you did want to go this bright, I suggest you go uh, on all the shadows, you just cool down all of the shadows. So I'm trying to like find all of these shadows and just desaturate them or cool them down. Because they're warm both in the shadow and outside of it. And that was just a little um, much. So control H, U, and then desaturate. So you could have kept the areas that are touched by the sunlight. You could have made them warmer, but the shadows could have been a little bit more cool. So desaturated or a completely different color entirely. That would have really, really done a lot for your painting. Um, making them a little lighter for the subsurface scattering. If she is a glowy object, she seems like she's a seductress or some kind of seductive person. I need them dark, but I also don't want them too saturated. No, I think I like the blue. It's not going to read as blue. It's just going to read as a shadow. Trust me, this is not part of her color combination. She's still a white character. She's still white. <clears throat> So blue, and then just raise that, lower that down, and then just raise this up. Any more patches, I just do the exact same thing. I shift it over to the blue, lower saturation, and then raise that up. And then for, the, for her face, what you've done is you've given me a very, very masculine face. And if she is a seductress, like she is like kind of, I don't know if that's a word. Um, if she is trying to seduce you, I would really, really give that downward tilt for the eyes. Enlarge the eyes. And raise that up and then get the density. And um, shrink the nose. Give it more of an alien touch. Give her less of a round prepubescent face and some more real bone structure. Very recognizable alien beautiful bone structure. And the mouth could have been restricted to the width of the eyes. Part of the female uh, beauty standard, if you guys have seen it before, is the eyebrow arc. I've talked about that a lot. You flattened it a little bit, which is why she looked just a little bit masculine to me. And you drew in every... See how it looked like a boy? Like a prepubescent boy? And then you kind of forgot. You drew in every single lash line, which is a big mistake. 
and you forgot the lower eyelids. So these are some of the suggestions. Just to quickly patch this up and post it to your to your portfolio, these are the recommendations. Before you attach it to your portfolio, I recommend you apply some of these. Uh, but if she is a light source, then she's supposed to be bright. Um, in fact, I recommend you brighten her up just a little bit more, but only in, only in gradients, of course, and only in... Um, Oops, I need to use highlights. And only in some areas, not everywhere. And again, we need to think about the cylinder when we're shading some of these features. So right off the bat, the arm needs more core shadows, real in like indication that the light source is nearby. It seems like it's coming in from the side. So this, this arm alone, do you see what that did? Just this core shadow alone made the arm feel very three-dimensional. Okay, so I have to go very, very soon. I'm so sorry I couldn't get to everyone. It's just so, so, so much suspense for us to uh, to wait till Thursday to get the rest of these, to see the rest of these, but it'll, it'll be a nice wait for us. So I'm just casting some more light and ca cast shadows just across the arm. So sorry about how short today class. Oh, it's the usual length, but for the quick, quick, like the challenges, I usually like to lengthen the classes just a little bit. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing just a little bit of reflectivity, and I want to cast a shadow on this arm from the torso on the arm. And this is why it's hard to be a 2D artist. You have to think about form and the design and everything else, all these other sciences and schools of thought that have to be there in your, that you have to ruminate on, on top of everything else you have to do, on top of the gesture and the anatomy and everything. You still have to make all of these really, really well, um, like these guided choices, these precise choices, everything has to be calculated. So, color dodge. I'm just going to cast some shadows. If she is very bright, there's a light source nearby her. And that really bright light source nearby is indicating that these cast shadows are coming off a very, very strong light source. So, there we go. Okay, so we're just casting some shadows still. I would, um, like, brighten this whole thigh up. So any questions so far? And it has to be questions related to today's topic. Don't ask me about how to design your portfolio. Um, as for another day, and I've talked about that before. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing some brightness on the side. So you have to find, let me just give you a quick, quick tip on finding core shadows. So yeah, I'm looking, at, I'm looking for core shadows, but I need to show you guys how to look for them. So look at your object, look at your object, and if you can see that it's kind of a very cylindrical object, we think about the presence of the light source. The light source is shining this way. Half of this object moving down this way and some of it moving down that way is going to be not as bright as the part that does directly look at the light source. We've talked about this before. I've talked about every single point of this uh, shape revealing, releasing a vector and it kind of uh, gives away whether or not the displacement is, is really high in relation to the direct light that's coming from the light source. This, of course, looks completely away from the light source and it's casting. It's going to be one full cast shadow. The other side we can't see, but also not as bright as the main belt. So when I'm shading an arm, I look for this belt. I look for the swell of the form of the native geometry, and that's where I radially build up the shadow, the light, sorry. And then when I build it up, I don't just throw a big bunch of highlight everywhere. I slowly build it up radially, meaning the fatter the bulge of the sphere or the cylinder gets that's where I bring in the most light and the blue here is a um, just an example of what I do with the light source of course it has to be brighter so all of these character designs today that we, we've looked at have had a real real deficit of core shadows um, a real deficit of accurate core shadows of geometry of form and the reason why that is is because you guys don't do enough form studies. Trust me, those boring, annoying, gray, blue-looking form studies make these look better. They make them look much better later on. You actually benefit from this. So there's a reason why right now, in this constraint of time, I can find all of these core shadows and get the read instantly. And that's because of the, my form study background. 
You guys can do the exact same thing. It's not magic, it's not instinct, it's not style, it's all science and geometry and, and, and architecture. It's nothing, nothing, nothing new, nothing significant, nothing groundbreaking. It's the same old science, the same old rules of physics, and the same old earth we live on, just along three dimensions, okay? So challenge, watch, B-movie, every time they say word B, you watch this practice. <laughs> Um, how to do subsurface scattering on a white object. What is the saturation saturation belt color? There is none. Saturation only happens on an object that is um, colored. It gets more of its color because it's going to be like an inside-out glow. So you get more light feeding the color on the inside and you cast out that cast shadow completely because the light is glowing on the inside. Subsurface scattering happens on see-through objects, translucent objects. Um, on a white object, it would only be uh, bright. So... Just look it up, like a white cup, uh, sunlight. Let's look it up. Image. Let's try to find one that is translucent. We probably won't. It's always some super sort of st stupid teacup thing. Maybe like a plastic cup. There we go. Um, this has an extreme amount of subsurface scattering. It's not just white, it's see-through. So the light is sitting inside and it's very, very reflective. So this is an example of that. The glass has no color. What it, that, what it is reflecting is the color of the substance inside it. So if the white object is nearby a lot of color, that white object will inherit some of the color nearby. If there is zero, zero color nearby that object, it'll just stay white and bright. It'll just have a, a lot of reflection coming through it. But uh, they're all like clay. They're all like very, very dense. They're not see-through. They're all, they're all like cups of uh, like ceramics. I'm trying to find one that is see-through. Maybe this one is just a little see-through. It's kind of like a see-through style. Do you see that color under here? The substance is see-through. The subs substance is translucent, and the cup is translucent, and we're seeing some of the color shine through. So in this area where there should have typically been a cast shadow, remember it's a silhouette state that makes a subsurface scattering happen, um, we have a bunch of saturation. That's subsurface scattering right here. Stupid Shutterstock. Like, fuck you, Shutterstock. Like how many times have I, have I seen like really really good references, and I couldn't even get them because the stupid fucking watermark is on. It. Like screw you, man. Every single time, this stupid watermark's just been in my face. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, that's typically what subsurface scattering is. I have a whole video on it if you guys are still having trouble understanding it. For gestures, would you recommend using one photograph as reference or many? Um, no, for, for really, really getting into gestures, you watch a video of the gesture. Don't use still images. Still images just lead you to memorizing that still, that one still frame. When you look at a video of a expansive gestures, you appreciate the frame that came before and the frame that came after. And that makes you draw better. That makes you think about rotation. It makes you think about the origin of this arm, the destination of this arm, and the frame in between all of that that you've decided to, to, to portray. Are these challenges generally meant for those who have completed the 14-day challenge? No, 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 no. There's no, that's, there's no rules like that. Um, there's no deadline for 14-day challenges. There's no, there, there's nothing like that in the graduation system or some sort of like, uh, I don't know. There's no system here. <laughs> um, it, there's some rules to help guide the challenges to ensure their success. But no, this is for anyone who wanted to join. This was available for everyone to vote on and join, just as long as you followed the brief and downloaded the resource pack. Um, how do you cover up your flora humanoid without using costume or too much nudity if you want it to be true human anatomy? Um, if you wanted a complete human anatomy and you didn't want to touch the hum that human part of the noid, um, then you could have found a way to generate the, the form using layers of petals. That was one thing I could have done. Um, you could completely get rid of certain signatures, so you, you didn't have to make a female with breasts. You can make it fully nude. Um, but no breasts, and it's still a female. Um, it doesn't have, doesn't need breasts. It doesn't need mammary glands. You really start have to thinking about biology when it comes to this stuff. Um, what else? I would have taken away hair. I would have taken away a nose, um, and kept everything in completely intact. And where I would have left some areas behind that are very, very petal-like, so the fingers could have been weeds. It doesn't necessarily have to have petals. Not a lot of it has to be about petals. Um, there could have been places that you unwrap, so the thighs could have had layers and layers of petals in them, and you could have shown that. Maybe the thigh, there is no flesh, there is no muscle work. The muscle itself could have been weeds. Uh, you just have to think about an anatomy. The heart, the lung system could have been very visible. Maybe there's not a skin layer. 
um, and you have you can't have a full human that was a humanoid you can't have a full human uh, so you, we could have seen the heart beating right there under all the petals we could have seen the skeletal structure but it's a, a bunch of really really dense weeds we could have seen the spine and the lungs and the and maybe it doesn't have an intestinal system these are the questions that are very very scientific um, kind of you have to ruminate on it scientifically um, it's, it has nothing to do with art and all about function and form and mechanics. And at that point, you have to unwrap the human body and choose what you're preserving and what you're what you're completely emitting. So you could have left out skin. You could have left out the skeletal structure entirely. It could have been a spineless little weed with a little bit of petals at the top of its head or some grass at the top of its head. It could have been a complete mushroom with no legs and arms, but it could have been like a like I, like I don't know how you would have no legs and arms and how it would move but again I can't do these at the top of my head because you really have to think about how this creature is moving um, thanks a lot for the suggestions you're very welcome I'm so sorry if I haven't gotten to everyone I'm really really short on time I wish I could push this into seven uh, but I have to get out of here um, I have a hard time making gestures not so stiff do you have any suggestions don't remember how I said there's three stages for gesture drawing skip the shapes and skip the final line art uh, Maggie focus only on those really really raw just C S or I letters to represent the gesture um, basic shapes basic line no, not shapes basic lines and watch videos Maggie watch videos of someone jumping watch videos of someone on a trampoline and follow it frame by frame reproduce that gesture frame by frame just with lines just with one line for the spine two lines for the legs two lines for the arms and a, and a circle for the head try to capture it draw stick people and draw very flexible stick people um, but use the use the video and and stop the video slow the video down on YouTube freeze it frame by frame and capture it this is what I assign to all my private tutoring uh, students who want to get better in their gesture I completely get rid of all the stuff they depend on which is drawing a head and eyes and hands because that's what makes it stiff you guys don't think about the spine what's happening just on an x-ray skeletal level and that's what drawing stick men and animating stick men really helps for you, uh, like helps you develop. Of course, don't draw actual stick men. Try to capture the real length to the torso ratio and the head across the body eight times. Um, try to capture real anatomy in that uh, first li li line layer. If you're really bad at gestures, you got to break these layers down. You can't do them all at the same time. You have to learn it bit by bit. The better you get at form and identifying geometric shapes, the more you can start introducing shapes on top of those uh, stick figures. Um, uh, is there a limit for humanoid proportions and anatomy like belly button and stuff there was no limit there was you just had to find a way to mechanically weave it together I would have left out the belly button uh, there's no need for a belly button it wasn't born of an umbilical cord it wasn't given birth to maybe it was born in a petal maybe they are exo uh, they're maybe like asexual creatures they kind of just fertilize they're not sexual that is sexual though it's not asexual there's just kind of external fertilization let's call it uh, maybe they were born inside a little bud or something like that so they didn't really need a, a you know they were, had roots really to feed them they didn't have a bunch of umbilical cords or something like that maybe they did maybe they do need a belly button um, it really just it depends on what you want to do ears did they need ears maybe they have large ears uh, maybe they have humongous ears and the head is only tiny and you have humongous ears and they have only eyes they don't need a nose or a mouth they have these tiny little whiskers that help them look around and feel around. it's more of a creature design remember than it was a costume design a lot of you guys took it down a costume design route um <laughs> sfw um okay for gestures do you recommend one photograph um, I kind of lost concept of time for a while, but have been working on this for a while. Is there a chance that it could be critiqued next class? A couple of hours left to finalize. I will be putting these, the, the people who did who did submit their work today, I will, putting the, I will be putting these in priority. I'm not going to add to this list until I know for sure I can cover everyone's. And I'm going to try to make Thursday's class two hours. Um, has the next challenge been determined yet? No, it hasn't been determined. I will be running a little poll um, to decide on our next themes. Um, if you guys haven't joined the Discord yet, please do join the Discord. Um, if Marco can link it here, um, on the Discord, I'm going to be asking you guys what you want to see for the next challenge. Um, and, uh, and I'll ask you and we'll take it from there. And the best suggestions I'll take into the poll and you guys can make the, the poll choices on the community. Like you can vote for your, for your next theme. So go to isarac.com, click on this little G, join the community. And I'll be posting the poll up here. Gotta unpin this little baby. Oh, not 
I'm not in my mod account. All right. Um, let me see if there are any more questions. <clears throat> All right. Sabak, I think people are just assuming that they have to look like inspirational pictures, meaning that they have to be very human. Uh, the inspirational pictures have kind of... They, they, it was very, as you can see, I had like three. It's very difficult to find that. And I and I didn't want to link the fish people thing from Pirates of the Caribbean because it would have been fish people. Um, so that was a little bit of a, it was a very difficult thing. I personally didn't want floral humanoids to win. I wanted the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the companion, the magical companion, the creature design, the actual animal creature design for magical companion, which I'm going to have in the next poll. But it was very difficult explaining this one, and I, and I very, very many times in the critique hours from this day to, to, the, to the day um, back when I announced it, I kept saying, remember to weave the anatomy. Don't use scarves and petals for hair uh, hairdresses or, or, or something like that, or headpieces. It's not about costume. I've said that many, many times. But a lot of you did amazing. They're still wonderful pieces. They still they, they still pass, and I'm sure a lot of art directors would have just used them anyway. They're just so pretty looking. Um, but if you really did have like a like a story in your hands where you were designing the dead man's um, um, You're drawing Davy Jones ship and these people have been on the ship for so long their very anatomy their humanity was stripped off and replaced with that of the sea That was beautiful what they did and um, you have to be able you can't get away with the costume thing you can't just give them costumes in the shape of um, You know in the shape of uh, fish people um, you had to really make them fish people that would let that only very little human left to them. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, I feel so super that I'm trying to move away from costumes so that I can make the costume better. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's anatomy, it's mechanics, it's biology. You are a concept artist, so you have to be a scientist as well. You have to be an, an architecture, an, an architect, sorry. You have to be um, a physicist. You have to be all kinds of stuff in order to really pull off something that's believable. And unfortunately, they don't hire scientists or biologists. I mean, sometimes they do. They did for Avatar, the movie um, Cameron's Avatar, and they tried to find ways to make it feel very realistic. And that's that's concept art gone to the next level, you know? Um, but, uh, but until then, we're pretty much responsible for every, every avenue of design, all sciences, all design, all color, all costume stuff also up to us and, uh, and, and the delivery and the, and the, and the um, the illustration aspect and the, uh, the technique and the realism and the cotton, the, 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 the composition and all of that stuff is still our responsibility on top of all that extra science we have to think about. Um, do you do reimagining challenges like remake design of Crash Bandicoot? Uh, no, I've never done anything like that. We haven't been doing challenges for very long, only a solid year about now. All right, so that's it for today. Thank you everyone for joining. I promise I'll get to the rest of these next week. Um, just hang tight if I haven't looked at your work. And if you have um, updates for your work, maybe I can add them. Uh, but I do want to see these corrected, and I do want to see your notes posted from today if you want to win some brushes. But I'll see you guys next Thursday, this Thursday, sorry, next class, Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Have a great day, guys. Bye.